morning we're in John chapter 9. If you're using the uh, Bibles in the back of the pew in front of you, you can find that on page 859, I think. Nope, 895. John chapter 9. <clears throat> As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight, and so they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and what would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and is he who is speaking to you? He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Jeff texted me last night said, Am I reading this entire chapter? <laughs> I said, Yes. 
I like to preach through entire chapters. That's what I like to do. So you are reading it. Um, hey, good morning. Welcome to King's Cross. We are in uh, John, the, the Gospel of John, and uh, enjoying this story. Uh, took us a while to get through chapter 8. Thankful to be in 9 um, and hear this story. Um, this week we see this, this amazing story. Uh, it's a story... Um, that we're going to walk through together, glean from a little bit, and, and, and maybe even look at a few parts that we sort of miss pretty easy uh, in this type of a story because of what's happening is so magnificent. I don't know if you've heard someone tell a story that's like almost seems so crazy and so far out there that everyone hearing the story is sort of looking around going like, does anyone believe this? Like... Right? Like I, sometimes I feel I'm not the most interesting man in the world, but I, but I do sometimes tell a story that happened in my past. And I'm like, no one believes this. Like this, there's, there's this, this is so far from reality. Um, Amy and I were watching a, a season of Survivor recently, um, and we, we, some we got back into during the pandemic. It's, it's because of the pandemic. Um, and we we're listening to this man tell the story about when he was canoeing on the Amazon. And he's like just, a, you know, a thrill seeker and he's canoeing and he's abducted by a tribe of, of natives and he's beaten with clubs and they were going to kill him and then he, he escaped their captivity. And so he's telling people throughout this, 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 this uh, season what happened and every single person he tells doesn't believe him. And you can just see it on their face. They're like, mm -mm, that did not happen, coach. That did not happen. And uh, the funny thing was, is at the end of the season, he took a lie detector from one of the most famous uh, bodies that does that, and he, he was telling the truth. Like, so the whole time, it was like, no, this didn't happen. Hey, some stories are so different than your reality. Some stories are so different than your reality that it seems like it could not have happened. And when we talk about stories in scripture or we use the word stories in the Bible, we're not saying fictional stories. We're saying these are true stories and they happen. They happen and it doesn't really matter if, if, if that doesn't seem like your reality. We have such limited reality, so, such little exposure to actually what is even happening in our world right now. We have to acknowledge that this morning. We have to acknowledge that God is moving across this world in amazing ways. And sometimes like we get into the normalcy of our lives and we can't see it. So let me invite you this morning to leave that behind for a minute. Leave the normalcy of your life for just a moment and see how God moves. Because there is a shadow, there is um, a reflection of what God is doing in your life, even in this story today. So that's my, that's my invitation to you this morning. Let's pray and we'll jump into the passage. Father, we um, love you. We, we, we see, we acknowledge this morning, even as we sang, like your, the presence of God amongst his people is here, is active. And so, Lord, we, we acknowledge your presence, God, and we come under the lordships of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we ask you this morning to keep us in the power of your word this morning. That as I teach, Lord, I don't just ask you to bless what I have to say, Lord. I want to just give you my entire life right now. I certainly want to give you this pulpit, this message in this time to do whatever you want to do. Um, to bless your people, to encourage them, to um, help us see you. And so God, we, we, will you do that? Will you move? Will you have your way amongst us, Lord, as we, as we look at you. We look at the preciousness of the gospel this morning. We see life change and we see so much happening in this story. Lord, would you move on us and transform us? Don't let us walk out of here the exact same way we came in, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, similar to John 5, we see in in this chapter, um, similar to John, Jesus is presented as one who gives physical and spiritual life. He gives physical and spiritual life. That's what's going to happen in our passage today. And it's different from John chapter 5 in that Jesus, in John chapter 5, moves from deed, what he did, to explaining it, like the word. Deed to word. But here it's different, isn't it? It's opposite. He moves from word to the deed. Like that's what he does. He, he loops back around at the end with more words. So that's, that's sort of the, 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 the throw of the story today. And he brings a man who sat in permanent darkness. He sat in permanent darkness to see the light, both physically and spiritually. And then we get to see at the end the Pharisees and sort of how they in, in, engage this. And, and, and they thought that they had clear sight. And actually they were blinding themselves even in the moment and by rejecting Jesus. And that's the, like the one big takeaway for you today. Like right at the beginning, the biggest takeaway you could have is that in this story, what we see is that rejecting Jesus, it means spiritual blindness. That's what it means. And spiritual blindness means eternal death. So the stakes are actually quite high. It's not just something uh, of a story that's, that's meant to encourage us, just lift our emotions and spirits a bit. The stakes of what's happening here are actually quite high. Let's jump into the text, verse one. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So somewhere in between the end of the last feast and the Feast of the Tabernacles and the next feast, the Feast of Dedication, somewhere in that three months, this, this story plays out. This thing happens. And they're walking and they see a blind man who was blind from birth and the disciples asked him a question. Hey, Rabbi, let's stop and have a theological conversation here. Which I think is kind of funny because like they've seen Jesus do amazing stuff, right? And they want to go to seminary right now, right? Like I think I would be like, is he going to heal him? <laughs> you know, side bets on what, how he does it or, you know, like I, I just, it's just interesting that the disciples right here are like, they're not apostles yet. They're like, let's talk theologically. Is this... Is the sin of the man, is it his parents, is it his, he was born blind, what do we, how do we deal with that? Now, what's interesting here is that the question actually does matter. It really matters. It matters to you and me, and here's here's why. The disciples were assuming that according to Psalm 51, where David says, in the womb, I knew sin, right? So they are assuming that you can actually sin before birth, They have some framework for that, okay? So we see that a little bit. We also see in chapter 5, in verse 14, and then in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians about how they took communion. And he was actually saying, hey, because you guys take communion, like just coming up to eat it and not looking at the body of Christ, some of you are getting sick and some of you are dying. So, So there is a framework in Scripture both for this like idea in Psalm 51 that, that sends something that actually could happen before birth. And then, and then there's this framework that like, hey, sometimes our consequences of our own sins cause us problems, can cause us sin and sickness. And then you see in Exodus 25 and 34, 7, that there's a connection between the sin of our parents, the sin of our parents, and that's related to us. So there's There's all that framework in scripture. Now, in Romans chapter five, six, and seven, in those chapters, Paul argues from a certain point of view that human sin and death, that human sin and death are not just personal problems, they're corporate problems. So that's what Paul argues throughout those chapters. He tells us that through one man's sin brought death. One man's sin brought death, which that's why Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, you guys are slaves to sin. They're like, what? Like, we're, we're God's children. He's like, no, you're slaves to sin. Through one man's sin, death reigned. So that's what Paul teaches in Romans 5. He says, because everyone remains a slave to sin unless they're set free from the redemptive work of Christ. 
in Romans 6. So you might just ask yourself now, alongside of the disciples, are there generational curses? (laughs) Like, in what way am I connected to my parents? Like, are there generational curses that sort of follow us? Like, my dad's dad's demons that sort of, like, kind of haunt me today? Are the, is that a reality? I think the, the, the thrust of Scripture and the thrust of Romans and sort of what's happening with these disciples' questions comes out like this. The skeletons in your closet... The skeletons in your closet are not put there by your dad and your shady grandma. They're not. Not so much that they're put there. Our parents have given us patterns. They've given us sort of ruts to which we have found similar related ways of sinning and patterns in this world that can cause um, certain sins to, to sort of come alive. And, and, and even science says that there's some hereditary realities to some propensity towards certain sins. Like, so that's, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's not a thing at all, but I'm saying, hey, like what Romans teaches us and what the Bible says that your skeletons, they're the work of your first parents. They're, they're the, that, that you were in Adam, your, your daddy of sin, like you were in Adam when he rebelled against God. Like that's the reality for us today. When Adam broke God's commandments, we were in him and we are all born into, into that sin, into that reality. And that's true about this man at the gate. That's true about you. That's true about me. It's true about everyone. But that is not the end of our story, thank God. Just as you were in Adam as he took that devastating fall, so now all who believe in Jesus are in Christ through faith. So now everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is in Christ and is justified by Christ through faith. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So your generational lineage, your family tree full of all the realities that outlive our parents, the consequences of alcoholism, of poverty, of identity issues, of self-worth, of depression, all those realities that linger and they feel like dark forces haunting you, like all that is there, all that is there, all this fallen nature is there. However, however, the goodness of God appears. So this is their question, like they're, they're actually dealing with stuff that's really important, that's really like faces who they are and, and their, real, um, 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 their real relation to sin in life. So it's not just a silly question. The disciples' question seems narrow-minded, but how, it, how it's asked even, it seems sort of like narrow-minded, but they're asking the right person. So here's what we have in, in, in verse three. Jesus answers them. He says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So actually in this situation, like, don't think that way. Like, don't think that way, disciples, is what Jesus is saying. He's like, I want you to focus on something else. I want you to think, like, in this very moment, this thing happened for this moment that God's glory might be displayed. Remember last week I said, hey, God's glory is the going public of his attributes, of his nature, like who he is, what he's capable of. Like, so, so in this moment, in this situation, this happens so that God's glory might be manifested in the world and displayed. And I think what could change in our lives if we thought about our lives in this way? 
If we thought about our pain and we thought about our suffering, we thought about the things that we've gone through or that, man, you're going to go through, like what would change in our lives if we weren't so quick to just wonder, what did I do wrong to get smacked by God right now, right? Like to have that type of question us, but instead ask the question of how does this glorify God? How does this glorify God? How would that change our story? He says in verse five, I'm the light of the world. Like that's what's happening, that through this story and through this one man's story and this one man's situation, he's proclaiming again for the second time that he's the light of the world. And that's not like some little thing that just happens in John. It's actually throughout scripture dozens of times there is a connection between light and how we experience God. Look at Psalm 27. You don't have to look. Let me just read it. Psalm 27, 1. This is David. He says, the Lord is my light in my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Or Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. We actually see this narrative over and over and over again. It's a theme that's well pronounced in the Old Testament and in the New. So look at Ephesians 5, 8, for at one time you were in darkness, but now you're in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So even Paul sort of takes from this and he's like, let me, let me teach you how to live. You have a relationship to God that is really well defined by light. That's how we experience God, light. There's dozens of passages that speak of God and our experience as he being light in our darkness. Like that's the reality and that's what Jesus is saying. This, is, this story is how I want people to start experiencing me, the savior. And so he, he spits on the ground. He, he, he says, having said these things, verse six, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So like, it, the, like this is sort of crazy because like, um, you know, he's spitting and you would think that there'd be more focus on the method. You know, in the conversation, like uh, somewhere we got our ethics uh, or our etiquette wrong. It is Christ-like for you to spit. Um, that's the reality. But, um, but it's just weird that there's not more focus on that or there's not like denominations or brands of Christianity that um, thinking spitting is a good thing to do. Um, but but it, it's not focused on because of what happens next, right? Because spitting in the ground and putting in the guy's eyes and then him going and washing it, he came back seeing. No one cared how he did it. No one cared how he did it because it's so amazing what just happened that a guy who was blind from death saw again. For the first time this man saw, he, he could see and the method's not even mentioned again because the, um, the reality is amazing. That's what happened. It, it, it is amazing, it, which makes the rest of the passage so silly, right? Like I just felt sitting there even listening it as somebody read it out loud today to me. Uh, and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, gosh, I have to unravel the conversations that then happen? Like what, why didn't everybody just believe in Jesus in that moment, right? Why didn't everybody just go, okay, he's God. What do we do next? Everyone should have done that. I don't know if you felt the lunacy of the conversations that then ensued afterwards, which we'll talk about some of them, but like it was insane, right? What in the world? Miracles have never been enough for humans. They just have never been enough. Ever since God called a people to himself and started doing amazing things, and I think in each one of us, there's sort of this person that's like, you know, if God would just do this, you know, if he, if he just take care of that debt or if he just, you know, help me be healthy or if he just help my children know Jesus or if he, right? Like we all kind of have a contract that, that maybe we don't show, but it's like, man, if I could just see a miracle, right? Like if I, if I saw that, I'd believe in Jesus forever. Like I even know from my own experience, that's not true. I wish it were, I wish it were. 
Just the miracle alone isn't enough. That's something that we see here today. This disagreement even just immediately sort of erupts in in verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. They couldn't even see it. Like they've known this guy their whole life. They They passed by this guy every day and they're like, no way. And the only thing that was different is he could see. That was the only thing that's different. He kept saying, I'm the man. (laughs) So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? Like you get the suspension of belief that's happening in the story as they sort of argue about this. The disagreement's not a matter of mistaken identity here. It's just not. It's their inability to see the man healed. That's the problem. Like that's, that's what's going on here. The man's testifying. The man called Jesus did it. And now Jesus is gone in the story. He's like out of there. There's just a bunch of people sitting there arguing with this guy who can see now. And Jesus is, he is, he is split. He's not there anymore. Um, He, he, he's, he's the expert of entrances and exits. He's the all time uh, winning champion of hide and seek in Nazareth as a boy, right? Like he, he, he can split and then show up in the most amazing ways, which sounds kind of funny, right? Like that he was a baby and he was playing peekaboo with his parents, right? Like that, that sounds funny, but like here's the reality. He was always where he needed to be. He was always, that's, some, that's a sense we're taking from John is Jesus was always where he was supposed to be. He was always where he needed to be. He was always where the Father willed him to be. He was in the right place at the right time. And listen, if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, do not witness Jesus playing hide and seek from you. He's near you. He's near you. He's not, he's not hiding from you. If, if you believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, died the death that you deserve and rose from the grave, Christ is in you and you are in him. And that is the best reality that you will ever know. Like don't witness Jesus as this guy who's just tripping out and bugging out and he's coming back and that's how you've experienced him in life, okay? That's not, that's not him, he is, in, he, he is in you, you are in him. Yes, we're called to seek him. Yes, we're called to connect with him. Yes, we're called to pursue his presence. Yes, all that's true, but it's because we wander. We wander away from him. We're far off from him. We we are the ones that are neglectful of his presence, and it's not the other way around. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. I love that. Formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, hey, he put mud in my eyes and I, wa- and I washed it and I see. And, 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 and some of the Pharisees, like, I love this. This is, this is all the things that they say. Like some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. So you have, you have one group of people that's like, he can't be from God because he healed on the Sabbath. We've heard that before already. And then you got another group that says, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And then there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, who do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. So no one really has a good beat on what's happening. They're all willing to argue about who Jesus is. Feels like much of society um, right now. It's like, who's Jesus? No one gets that right. Um, and, and so you just have disagreement. People, say, some say, like, he, he has to be from God. He has to be. He's healing. No one, no one does that. Some are like, hey, well, no, you can't heal on the Sabbath. It's just this theological conversation that's happening. And the guy's like, hey, I can see. <laughs> I can see. Like, I, that's what I have to say. He has to be at least a prophet. Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. Uh, okay, so the parents are coming in. Like the parents are, let's bring the parents in because they would know. Let's, let's ask the parents. And so the parents are brought in and the parents, they just verify that he's their son. Like, I, I was like, man, thanks mom, thanks dad, like help, help me out here. They're just like, 
He's our son. He was born this way. We, that's him. We think it's him. They're afraid. They're afraid because they're Jews. Like they understand that what this means. If they were to say, hey, he was healed by Jesus and Jesus, he's the son of God. We believe Jesus is who he says he is. We're his disciples. Like if they say something like that, they're in trouble. So fear sort of holds them back. So we have the parents as the newest, you know, member to the crowd that just sort of doesn't get it right. And so the man testifies again, I was blind, now I see. And the, the Pharisees are frustrated. They're frustrated to hear it. Verse 23, therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who, has, who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And then he's just like kind of very smart and, 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 and sharp says, do you also want to be his disciples? Which he knows that they don't want to be, but, they're, but, but he's just sort of like, I guess he's over the conversation, right? Like he's just sort of over, this is futile. Like, what are we doing? You're not going to believe me? Like you're not asking for the right, uh, I think the question sort of reveals they're not asking for the right reasons in this moment, are they? They're not asking for the right reasons. And it says, and they reviled him, which I love. I mean, I just love that. We don't use that kind of language in our world, right? Like, I mean, Monday or Tuesday, I'm going to revile you. Trevor, I'm going to revile you. I, just, I don't know what that means. It sounds bad, though, right? They reviled him. So you are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses, which is hilarious because they didn't want to go back to Abraham because Jesus took it to them last week about Abraham, if you remember. So they're like, we're Moses' disciples. And, uh, and, and so they, they, they put him out. We know that God's spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And so the guy's like over it, right? He's done with it. So he's like, the man answered, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began, like this is the ultimate gaslight, right? Ultimate gaslight. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. Of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. Back to the question of the disciples. Back to the beginning of the story, right? Back to the big question. You, and, and now it's not a question. It's not a question. This is like one of the saddest things right now. It's not a question. It's condemnation. You were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? This man has encountered the living God. The living God has healed his blindness. He has gone before the religious leaders in the world and they have put him in the same seat that he, he came there in. Condemned under sin. Condemned. Condemned under sin in that moment. How sad is that? And they said, get him out of here. And they cast him out. Now Jesus heard that, verse 35, right? He heard that, and so he comes around. But I just want you to hang in that gap for just a minute and feel that a little bit. You, you've ever had God move in your life and you've experienced something from God and that it just doesn't hang on as long as you wanted it to? Yeah? Like, I mean, not just like youth camp, like, I mean, we've experienced things in our lives as we've um, walked with the Lord and we've just been like, man, that didn't, that didn't last that long. Like, I wish, I wish that would have lasted a little longer, right? Like, what, what this tells me is like, we can actually experience spiritual things. We can experience very spiritual things. We could have, that doesn't mean that we're saved either. 
You know, when I, when I came from uh, darkness into a church on a Wednesday night, 20 some years ago, I experienced something that night that is hard to explain. I came down at the end of a service and I stood and some people prayed for me. I didn't really hear anything that happened in that service, but they wanted to pray for me and, and they prayed for me. Now in that moment, my life was defined by darkness. Like to be a bearage meant we were like the MVPs of darkness and sin. That was our reality. That's where I came from. We, we were the perennial winners of the sin category. Like that was us. And that's where I was when somebody laid their hand on me for the first time and prayed to God. And I've always explained it since the very first day as what I experienced was just a great light and heat. Just, just a blinding light and heat in that moment. And in that moment, all kinds of miraculous things happened in my mind, in my heart, and in my physical body that was addicted to many drugs and substances. And in that moment, all of those addictions left. Healing in my heart happened. Clarity in my mind happened. It was a, it was a full sweep. Praise God. But I left that night with a spiritual encounter in which God moved that I would say was light and was much like this man. It was much like this man as he's cast out in verse 35, Jesus heard that they cast him out and having found him said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. You see, for me that night, I had experienced a spiritual encounter. God certainly moved in my life in some way for his glory, but I did not see Christ that night. It wasn't until I left and I started to read the book of Romans and I struggled through that fifth and that sixth and that seventh chapter where, where I started to uh, begin to understand and see that, that humans needed a solution for our sin. Like there was a reason I was in darkness and I started to see, oh, it wasn't my dad Barney, it was my dad Adam that gave this to me. And I need a savior, I need a solution, or I'll just turn around and go right back to what I was doing. And it was right there in Romans chapter eight, where I heard the words, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that I saw Jesus, like the man saw Jesus in this moment and said, I believe. You can have spiritual experiences, you can have epiphanies, you can, you can have um, all of those types of things, then don't change us, they don't change us. Uh, the story for me was I heard and saw the gospel in the book of Romans, read and struggled with it, and in a moment I saw Jesus. I went from, from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. Salvation, that's what salvation looks like. And listen, Jesus is always pursuing us in that. He was pursuing me in that moment. I didn't find Jesus, he wasn't lost. He appeared to me in the gospel, right? Just like he is, appears in this man's life, he heals his blindness and he says, look at me, I'm the savior, believe in me. And he saw Jesus, and in this moment, he saved. And Jesus is like, for this is the reason I came, so that people who are in judgment and condemned in their sin can now see. That's why Jesus came, that's why he's telling the Pharisees and the Jews that they're, that they're slaves to sin, and that he came to free them. Jesus is always pursuing us. Like even now that I am saved, like I still feel this constant pursuit of my savior. I still feel this constant invitation of him through the gospel to believe and to see and to be renewed. Isaiah 53, six says, 
All we are like lost sheep who have turned each one to his own way. But he's the good shepherd, isn't he? He comes after the lost sheep. He said, do you believe in the son of man? Do you believe? That man encountered Jesus, the Messiah, the savior, and he was saved. He was saved from judgment. He was saved from that moment where where he he, he had it spoken over him that he was born in utter, utter sin. What they don't know is they are too. And Jesus says it like, hey, listen, some of the Pharisees near heard, heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Yeah, you are blind. You're worse than blind. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So he's like, listen, you should know better now. You don't have any excuses. That's what the gospel does. It takes away our excuses because it gives us the truth about our sin and it gives us the truth about who God is so that no one is without excuse. Hear Jesus saying this morning, I am the son of man, believe in me. Here's a few takeaways this morning. One, what do, what do we do with our story of sin and suffering? What do we do with our story of sin and suffering? We look at what God's done here. Hey, what do you do? Isn't it amazing that this is one man's story? We don't even know the guy's name, but isn't it amazing that God captured this story about this guy in scripture? You're gonna meet this guy one day. You're gonna meet him one day. Isn't that amazing? You have a story too. You have a story just like my story. You have a story, but what do you do about your suffering? What do you do about that? Here's a few, a few things we can take away. Suffering is under God's control. It's under his control. That, that means a lot, but I, you need to know that suffering is under God's control. The whole world is. The whole earth is. There's nothing that's out of his control. Sometimes there's a cause and effect relationship to our sin. Sometimes, not always, sometimes there is. That's true. But most often, suffering is allowed for God's glory. It's allowed for God's glory. And God promises not to waste one ounce of it. Not to waste one ounce of it. That's how God's glory works. That that in our present suffering, there is a future glory that far outweighs it. It far outweighs it, and that's hard to hear sometimes. And so what matters most in our suffering or your successes is recognizing Jesus. That's what the story teaches us, recognizing Jesus. Our story is about God at the center. It's about God at at the center. We're always asking questions that in context put us at the center. That's the reality of all the questions and all all the conversation. Our reality is that we need to see God at the center, believing the gospel and worshiping Jesus. This man could have taken the favor that he had from God and lived for himself, but he became a worshiper that day. That's our call in suffering and in success. This is one man's story of spiritual blindness. You have a story of your spiritual blindness. There's some of you that, that may not have, have seen Jesus yet. I pray that, that the gospel would invade and, and overcome all of your defenses and that you would see the preciousness of Christ who died for you, who loved you and gave himself up for you and who pursues you today. And some of you can see, but you won't open your eyelids because like there's a, there's a, there's a reality that like if you, you sort of want to stay partially spiritually blind because you don't want to like be responsible for what that would mean if you opened your eyes to, you know, like to the gospel and, 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 and Jesus was at the center of your life. Like there's a reality to that. But, like I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, there's just so many rules, you know, like you just see, you know, God's code like his his way of living as like killjoy and you don't you don't see how wonderful it actually is God's plan for our life and I think there's some maybe maybe even here today that have a false religion that's blinding you 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 have a false religion that's that's 
that's um, sort of self-justifying and hindering your need for Christ. That may be true about some of us here today, for sure. And I think, I think God wants to overcome those things in our lives. I think he wants to destroy them by the preciousness of the gospel, by his power. Like I think he wants to, he wants to get inside this heart that's always trying to limit and, and, and put ourselves at the center like, and miss it. Like he's, that's what is, we're witnessing in John. Like, and he wants to cause that sort of revival in us. I think that's true. I think that's really, really true. You know, there's revivals actually happening all over our, our nation and the world right now. I don't know if you know that, but like there's revivals happening all over, uh, dozens of revivals that are happening all over. Most recently we've seen on the news this revival in Asbury College and it was spontaneous led and uh, spontaneous happened, student led. And like right now, some of you probably heading up there. I don't know. But like there, there's this revival happening and I remember this week I saw reading different people's take on it and some of them were like really negative and, 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 uh, you know, super negative about it or whatever. And I, listen, I don't know what's happening out there. I haven't been there. I don't even know where that is. So uh, I don't know their doctrine. I don't know any of that. I, I don't know any of that. I've been a part of some moves of God that, that were like many revivals. And I've been amazed at God's way in which he moves in his people. So I grabbed one of my favorite books that, that, I, that I like to read when I, when I head down that topic. It's by Jonathan Edwards. It's his reflections on the New England revival. So there's, it's just packed full of awesome reflections. And I think sort of like this one part really helps us end today well. He says this in the book, once under the influence of spiritual pride, once under, one under the influence of spiritual pride is more apt to instruct others than to inquire for himself. It naturally puts on airs of a master, whereas one that is full of pure humility naturally has the air of a disciple. This is a very simple idea that he's just thinking about, like this is what marked the revival, is that people weren't walking around thinking they had it all figured out and they were the masters, right? I wanna see revival in my heart. Um, I noticed that the religious leaders refused instruction this morning. I just noticed that. Like, I want to see revival. I want to see it in my heart. I want to see it in your heart. And, and like, it doesn't have to turn into something that looks like a revival here, but if God would do that, I would be thankful. But I just, I long for spiritual sight. I long to see Jesus more clearly. I long for us to see him more clearly. I long for um, just passion and, and a boyishness of just like loving my father and loving his work and what he wants to do in our lives. Like I want that unhindered. I want that unhindered and I see all the ways in which people are hindered by their sin and I want God to take that away. And I think the only way to do that is to repent. Like to repent, ask God to be who he is and move in my life in the way that he wants for his glory, whether it's suffering or success, that's what I want. I want that for us. I want that for, for, for not just my life, for my children's lives. Like that's what I want to see. And so we should repent of our sins. The, the, the natural reaction to something like this this morning is to come to the table and experience the Lord's suffer, to, supper, to see Jesus' suffering and say, thank you for suffering for me so that I don't have to suffer eternally. Thank you for opening my eyes so that I could see you. I wouldn't have seen you any other way. So this morning as you come to the table, do that. Repent of your sins, see your suffering in God's hands, see him big enough to hold you wherever you're at and to give you his eternal life, to bring you through any physical darkness and any spiritual darkness and save you thoroughly, okay? Would you stand with me as we, as we come to the table of the Lord's Supper? I'm gonna read one passage as we, as we close this morning. is in Titus 3. It was sort of on my heart all week, and I thought I'd just do this as a benediction. It says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, 
and hating one another. That's every one of us. I don't care where you were born or what, how good you were your whole life. You may have been like 10 times better than me, but that's true about every one of us. For but then the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the gospel. Believe in Christ today. And so as you come, come and take a piece of the bread, dip it into the juice that represents Jesus' body that has been broken for you and his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you come this way, we have a team of people who would love to lay hands on you and pray for you. And maybe, maybe, maybe for the first time you would see Christ this morning, or maybe there's some darkness over your life that you need to see Jesus at the center of. Come get prayer, that's what we have it for. There is an anointing for that today. So come and do that. There are offering boxes in the back. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you and we ask, we ask God that you would open our eyes. The most miraculous thing that can happen in this world outside of Jesus being raised from the dead is the opening of blind eyes. Never before, the man said, never before has that been done. And yet you, Christ, you have done it with millions of people in every generation. And so God, we are filled with worship and thanksgiving today. And Lord, would you do it again in this place today and next week in hundreds and thousands of ways. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Come as you feel ready.